This is Alan Jay. I'm the National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at COA. You've logged on to this latest Zoom. We're very honored to have Congressman Lee Zeldin from New York. He'll be speaking on From Iran to the ICC, Threats to the U.S. and Israel. Um, with respect to Congressman's time, I'm going to turn the program uh -huh. over to uh -huh. National, uh -huh. National President of the Zionist Organization of America, Mort Klein. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for spending a, uh, <clears throat> an afternoon with a very distinguished member of Congress, Congressman Lee Zeldin. I'm honored to call him a personal friend. <laughs> He's one of the really great congressmen in all of Congress. <laughs> He's from uh, Suffolk County, New York. <clears throat> he became <clears throat> the youngest person to become an attorney in the state of New York at the time at age 23. <laughs> he spent four years in active duty. In military as a military intelligence officer, as a prosecutor. He was a member of the elite 82nd Airborne in the Army. <laughs> he was a paratrooper in Iraq. He left armed uh, forces as a lieutenant colonel. Then he became a state senator in New York, accomplished many important things, especially for small businesses. In 2014, he became a member of the House of Representatives, winning a seat in Congress from his district. He's a member of the Financial Services Committee, and the House Foreign Affairs Committee and is co-chair of the House Republicans Israel Caucus. He's one of the tremendous friends of the U.S.-Israel relationship. There's almost no one like him. He's really unique in how, what a strong supporter he is of uh, Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship. Uh, Lee Zeldin has spoken at our galas. He's spoken at our missions. And uh, I have to say, I also met his wonderful father. And his father told me he is very proud of Lee Zeldin. And so are we, Congressman Lee Zeldin. Well, thank you so much, Mort, uh, for your leadership. And uh, it's great to see uh, Dan Pollack and, uh, and Alan, thank you for your efforts here to get this all set up. Uh, I see we have great attendance uh, for what is an amazing organization. Uh, I'm proud uh, to be here at this uh, ZOA webinar. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your bold, courageous leadership uh, all year long. Uh, there are often times where uh, on particular issues, uh, there are people, groups, uh, unable, unwilling uh, to step up and, and sound off on what instinctively we know is the right path forward for policy. Uh, but you can always count on more Klein and ZOA uh, and really all of uh, the, the great team to courageously uh, stand up, even if they are going to be the only ones uh, or the first ones to put their necks out there uh, on very important issues for the United States, for our national security, for the U.S.-Israel alliance, for the Middle East and the world. Uh, it has been a uh, few years of welcome change that we just experienced uh, for the U.S.-Israel relationship. When I first got to Congress, uh, it felt like we were treating Israel like Iran and Iran like Israel. But for four years, we turned that around. Uh, from the historic Abraham Accords to moving the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, uh, to recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, and signing the Taylor Force Act into law, and so much more, so much more. Uh, the forward progress uh, has been something that I passionately, as all of you passionately wanted to build off of and still want strongly to build off on. There are some uh, who have been entering uh, higher offices of power and influence uh, who seek to uh, reverse that progress. Uh, they hold pro-Palestinian uh, anti-Israel views they uh, wouldn't want to see uh, Israel uh, and the United States continuing to strengthen this relationship. They would want conditions attached to support uh, for Israel. Uh, they would want us to weaken the Taylor Force Act or just ignore it altogether by providing 
uh, U.S. tax dollars to an entity that financially rewards terrorism and incites violence. There are people now inside the Biden administration and others in higher influence of office and power uh, who would want the United States to trip over ourselves to re-enter the Iran nuclear deal as is, even though that is impossible. Not only is it bad to uh, want to make permanent concessions in exchange of temporary concessions on the part of the Iranians, there are people within our government who would want to make permanent concessions in exchange for the hopes of securing temporary concessions on the part of the Iranians. This is uh, far worse than some of the circumstances we've lived through in the past. It's important, one, we don't set red lines that we're willing to enforce if crossed. We don't set deadlines, dates that only we care about, but not those who are on the other side of the negotiating table. Uh, it is important that we don't adopt the mentality that any deal is better than no deal at all. Uh, when we look at the Iranians, it's important to address the sunset provisions in the JCPOA, the flaws in the verification agreement, and the non-nuclear bad activities that were left out of the talks. As I'm a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and I was uh, engaged in a Q&A with Secretary Blinken during last week's hearing, I pointed out to him uh, what many of you feel is the obvious. Uh, that aside from, in addition to the concerns on sunset provisions and the verification regime, you have to deal with uh, the fact that once you negotiate away the leverage that brings your counterpart to the table, what leverage is left in order to deal with uh, everything else that has to be addressed between the United States and Iran? Uh, so there are, are very important decision points right now. And I'm just addressing here some of them. We've seen uh, the ICC taking action that is directly contrary to the United States uh, and Israel's best interests. It's important that we take a stand, that we be bold. Uh, we take action with teeth to try to uh, get the outcomes uh, that we need. That is at the United Nations. It's at, uh, at NATO. It's at UNRWA and elsewhere. Uh, these international alliances, too, uh, that we are strong, bold leaders, courageously speaking the truth, uh, rather than being silent because we are afraid of offending anyone. When you're silent, it ends up empowering, elevating, embracing causes uh, that we are strongly opposed to, uh, when oftentimes the right path forward is to identify, confront, and crush threats at the outset to ensure that it doesn't grow. Uh, so thank you for the invite to be here. It's an honor to be part of uh, ZOA's webinar today and so many other ZOA causes in the past. Uh, as I look forward to partnering on so many important ZOA causes in the future and to all of our attendees, thank you for being part of what is a great historic organization uh, that is close to heart for my family. Uh, I'm actually here in my office right now in, uh, in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, I'll show you that uh, behind me is a picture of uh, my, my great-grandfather who, uh, back in the day, several, day, uh, several decades ago, uh, was proud to be associated with ZOA around the time that a guy named Brandeis uh, was also quite uh, proud to be associated with causes uh, that you all are so passionately uh, and proudly connected to. Uh, so it's great to be with you. I look forward to the Q&A and thank you again for having me. Lee, I wanna actually reemphasize that in my opinion, uh, Congressman Lee Zeldin is the best friend of Israel and all of Congress, all of the Senate. There's no one like Lee Zeldin, very special man. <laughs> um, my question is, we keep hearing <laughs> that the Biden administration says we will go back on the deal and all they're asking, if we understand correctly, is that Iran fulfill their obligations under the old catastrophic deal. <laughs> um, and of course, if they do fulfill it, it's still a horrific deal because in seven years from now, their sunset closes and they will get, are able to move forward toward nuclear weapons. Are we at DOA understanding it correctly? Is that what Biden and Blinken are simply requiring uh, or, or uh, is, is to fulfill the old deal, or do they have any new ideas about making the deal at least better than what it was? 
Two thoughts. First thought on the sunset provisions, as you pointed out more, uh, there are sunset provisions uh, that will be uh, coming up several years from now. Uh, I would also point out, though, you can look at uh, the expiration of the Iran arms embargo last October uh, as being, in a way, a sunset provision. You, there are some sunset provisions coming due two years from now. Uh, but as more highlights, uh, there are some very important sunset provisions uh, that are several years out, but need to be all over the radar now if engaging in, converse, in conversation, dialogue, uh, and uh, compromise. Now, to Mort, your other part of the question, uh, where we experienced for, for a few years in the Trump administration a great symmetry, chemistry, uh, chemistry uh, and a really similar approach to these issues in the team around <laughs> President Trump, uh, whether it was Secretary Pompeo, Jared Kushner, Jason Greenblatt, Avi Berkowitz, David Friedman, and others, they all were pretty much well in line in their vision and their plan and their execution uh, in how to strengthen the U.S.'s relationship and how to uh, have a maximum pressure campaign on Iran, how to confront Iran and ISIS and, and other areas in the Middle East. What's different now is uh, the Biden administration has a little bit more of a team of rivals approach. Uh, I would not paint with one broad, br one broad brush uh, all of the people who are around President Biden. Uh, while it certainly is not the team that President Trump had, not by a long shot, uh, there are some members of President Biden's team who could be a little bit more reliable than some of the other voices on President Biden's team who are totally unreliable on the issues that you care about. Uh, so in trying to figure out uh, where that goes uh, as it relates to the JCPOA, the path forward, there are some people advising President Biden who strongly believe that the best path forward uh, is to do, as Mort just mentioned, uh, for the United States to trip over itself to come back fully in compliance with the JCPOA as quickly as possible, uh, and to hope uh, that the Iranians will come back into compliance with the JCPOA as quickly as possible not requiring any change to sunset provisions, any changes to uh, the verification agreement without any changes to any non-nuclear activity. There are some within the Biden administration who have a little bit better sense of reality uh, than, than, than that position that I just mentioned and more highlighted a little bit earlier. Um, in uh, the, the conversations uh, whether it's during Secretary Blinken's confirmation process or fast forward to his testimony before the House Foreign Affairs Committee last week, uh, Secretary Blinken seems to be a tad more in touch with reality than some of the other people in the Biden administration, like a Rob O'Malley. Um, and, and history and past statements should also be informative to try to determine where Rob O'Malley is in providing advice, where a Jake Sullivan is in providing advice. Um, and what is important is to be providing support and encouragement to any voice within the Biden administration, wherever, however, whenever they uh, provide any sense of understanding reality. And it is not a good grasp of reality when anyone says that the United States and Iran should just fully come back into compliance with the Iran nuclear deal as is, and that we celebrate that happy days are back again, uh, and that we can celebrate uh, a win from there, uh, and it's all good moving forward. Um, we need to push back whether it is with bad intentions that anyone in the Biden administration has that view, or if it's naivety that anyone in the Biden administration has that view. Uh, we must be strong in dealing with an adversary that does not respect weakness, they only respect strength. Uh, and also for us in our brainstorming, our strategizing, we need to understand that we can't paint everyone there with one broad brush, and that there are some within that administration uh, far worse than some others within the administration. Thank you, Congressman. I'll, uh, 
have one follow-up before I hit, turn it over to Dan Pollack. <clears throat> uh, we're very concerned, first of all, that Rob Malley is the envoy to Iran. Rob Malley is actually Jewish, believe it or not, and yet he's as hostile to Israel and a supporter, frankly, of Hamas and Iran as uh, anyone Biden could have chosen. <laughs> and yet, outside of ZOA, nobody complained about that, that appointment. <laughs> And my question, especially with, with Mali there, is it really possible that the Biden administration will start ending or reducing sanctions? Or do you think that won't happen uh, in anywhere in the near future? What is the situation with sanctions, which is so important to maintain a leverage uh, on Iran? So Robert Mali is somebody who, uh, who I had mentioned and Mort just brought up as well. And he is an example of someone who, based off of past statements, positions uh, can't be trusted. He was uh, a bad pick uh, for the position that he is in. Uh, Mally's views uh, can't be the one that win the day. Because to answer your question, Mort, if Rob Mally's views and approach are the views and approach that win the day, then what you may start seeing uh, would be unilateral sanctions relief, maybe even just as a quote unquote, good faith show in order to get a meeting. I mean, that is how weak some of these officials inside of the Biden administration are. As far as whether or not that actually will end up being the approach of the Biden administration, we don't yet know because there are some others within the Biden administration who have vocalized an understanding uh, that we should not be uni uh, unilaterally, proactively providing sanctions relief before the Iranians do anything. Now, I really hope that that is uh, the way that this ends up playing out. However, I'm not going to sit back and rely on hope. What I'll do is lean forward and strongly and as loudly and passionately advocating as possible not to provide any unilateral concession. Similarly, right now, the United States uh, Secretary Blinken and Jake Sullivan will be meeting with Chinese counterparts uh, this week in Alaska. And if I was to have one wish and one wish, wish only to their administration, it would be do not make concessions, any concessions at that table as I'm pretty sure China is coming to that table knowing one thing and one thing only, and that's not to make any concessions whatsoever. If I had two wishes, and this also once again relates to Iran, but when you sit down in Alaska with your Chinese counterparts is be strong. Mm -hmm. They don't respect weakness, they respect strength. And thirdly, while it's a, a list that is specific to China and there's a list differently that's specific to Iran is go in with your list. Uh, and that list should be, uh, you know, a list that can, can uh, involves a whole bunch of different issues that I won't get into because it's China and that's not why we're, we're here today. Uh, but to have a list of demands as it relates to Iran, because you should never sit down at the table where you're uh, only coming in with one ask or two asks where the, the Obama administration put it all on the talk of nuclear activity and everything that was non-nuclear, even the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles, all non-nuclear activity were, uh, were topics to save for another day. But once you get rid of the sanctions, once you provide the relief to the Iranians that brought them to the table in the first place, what leverage do you have left to deal with anything else that you need to deal with? Uh, so there's a lot of similarities, even as we go across uh, the landscape around the world as other issues impact this administration and, and uh, answers and, philo and uh, philosophy and approach and personnel get discussed for other regions and other nations. Well, Congressman Zelton, how refreshing to hear the whole truth from a member of Congress. This has become less common lately. Uh, by the way, I remind people intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles means they can go from the Middle East to America. They can reach us, and that's what they're developing. This is very frightening for the United States of America, uh, as well as Israel. And now I would like to turn it over to Dan Pollack to uh, ask a question or two. Thank you. I'm the Director of Government Relations for ZOA, as you all know, Congressman. 
and uh, thank you. Um, we've been pleased that whenever we've gone to your office, even if we have a long list of requests, uh, we, we get a great reception from you. You mentioned the Taylor Force Act, and there are a couple of US laws that some promises by President Biden uh, could potentially uh, violate. Uh, it would require a change in law to restore aid to the Palestinian Authority, as he said he's going to do, and also to open up the PLO embassy in DC because of the ICC problem, which International Criminal Court, which you mentioned, it's enshrined in US law, I believe, that they cannot open up an embassy in Washington, DC, as long as they're bringing a case against Israel or the US in uh, the International Criminal Court. Can you comment about whether you expect the administration to obey US law on these things? Similarly to uh, our Q&A on these past uh, questions is that we don't wanna make any bad assumptions. And even if you uh, receive information that uh, gives you a ray of hope or concern, uh, we never want to rest on assuming that the administration is just going to do the right thing across the board. We have to speak out on why the Taylor Force Act was passed in the first place. We have to educate on just how much money to this present day the Palestinian Authority pays uh, towards individuals for engaging in acts uh, of terrorism. Uh, to the individual, to their families, uh, this is a present day policy. This isn't a hypothetical for the future and this isn't a historically historical point that is left in the past. Money is fungible. And if, you, uh, if the Biden administration provides U.S. tax dollars to the Palestinian Authority for a purpose that might seem uh, the most noble of intentions uh, to uh, tear at your heartstrings for wanting to be uh, great humanitarians, as long as the Palestinian Authority is continuing to finance a terrorism and inciting violence, we can't be providing the money because it's just all fungible in the way they do their budgeting. Uh, will the Biden administration ignore US law? We don't know yet, but the safest assumption would be for us to uh, assume that they may not. Uh, and whether it's advocating to members of Congress, advocating to the, to the, the administration, uh, within the media, let them all know that the administration will not get away with it. They won't get away with it. And that needs to be part of their calculation because so often when a moment like this has happened in the past with administrations and parties in the past, <laughs> the calculation whenever uh, an administration would spend a dollar uh, in a manner that is not intended or provided for by law, it really does seem that it came down to whether or not they thought they would get away with it. And I think that might be a key part of the threshold and what, one of the reasons why ZOA needs to continue to exist and be strong. You know, Dan, you, you come to our offices and you will come to the offices of, uh, you'll have a conversation with a friend, uh, a neutral member, uh, or in a way at times what might feel like an adversarial member to engage everybody. And the message needs to be to anyone who will step on that uh, and cross the line on law is to let them know, let them all know that they will not get away with it. Uh, there are, or th there's the, the strategy of how to approach, engage uh, where you are a friend, where you build a rapport, an alliance. You are really, really good at being the good guy. And that's important. But you also need to be very good at being the bad guy at times, uh, because there are many in politics who respect the fact that if they are a true friend, because sometimes that word friend gets thrown around so much and is abused, a true friend you can have an honest discussion with. Uh, and 
when a friend crosses you, they know that there are consequences. Uh, and that's important on these issues. On the ICC, same thing. Uh, the administration has made some statements that you can call encouraging. Uh, and you can also look at past statements made by some who are in positions of influence. And you can call that discouraging and a warning sign. Will I sit here today and boldly predict that the administration will do the right thing uh, as it relates to the ICC? Or boldly predict that they will do nothing? Uh, we can't yet. Uh, and we have to act uh, really under the more cautious approach of assuming that they may not do the right thing. So strategically, we need to lean in with education and advocacy and letting the administration know uh, and others who may be their allies in Congress know that they won't get away with doing nothing. And that's why the ZOA exists. Thanks so much. We, we do try to do that. We have a lot of good questions, unfortunately, that everyone who asked them. We're not going to have time to get to many. I think just probably have time for one more to respect the congressman's time. Uh, and that one, I'd like you to go into some additional detail about the International Criminal Court, uh, the ICC. Uh, it's obvious that they are a threat to Israel. Can you explain how it is also a horrible example as a veteran of the United States military service? Uh, and this is a terrible precedent. And do you think that President Biden will maintain the sanctions that were administratively put on by the Trump administration on the prosecutors who are mishandling their responsibilities? Well, first off, as everyone on this call, I would imagine believes or they wouldn't be on this call. Uh, the U.S.-Israel relationship uh, is vital and attack on Israel is an attack on the United States. Uh, I believe that there's no stronger ally of the United States in the world than Israel. Uh, and when you see the ICC go after Israel, uh, the United States in many ways should feel like that is an attack on the United States. But beyond that, the ICC has also made statements going after uh, the United States directly. So as a service member uh, and also as a member of Congress and as a proud American, uh, I view the ICC as a threat to the United States, even if you take Israel totally out of the equation. Will the Biden administration uh, enforce, improve, strengthen the sanctions uh, to, uh, that we saw in the Trump administration? The answer is we don't know. Uh, but we have to speak up and sound off with the support that we have for that position to embolden anyone within the administration and in Congress uh, to know that they have support and people are paying attention. Uh, and that if anyone in the administration is successful in convincing the president uh, and the secretary of state to go and treasury to go in the other direction here, that they will not get away with it. Uh, and you know, that's maybe one of the most basic principles as we approach all of these issues uh, is in the education and the advocacy, the message when you know that you're being successful is when everyone uh, in the executive branch, everyone within the legislative branch, they all know that if they do the wrong thing on these issues that they will not get away with it. If uh, if you strategically can come up with only one simple plan of action, it maybe should be that. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you joining us. This should be, um, we will of course hear from you again and everyone is expecting great things from you, whatever you choose to do in the future, Congressman. Well, thank you so much for having me and everything uh, that you do. Uh, we are in the middle of a vote series here, so uh, so I, as I sign off, I head to the floor. Uh, I wish I can brag to you all about how uh, all of the votes are to save America, but that uh, unfortunately is not the alignment uh, in power at the moment. But that's why you all are tuned in here and active with ZOA, is that regardless of whoever is in charge uh, at any moment since your founding well over 100 years ago, is that you must always stay diligent uh, and on offense and leaning into all the issues you're passionate about to try to fight for and achieve the best outcome possible. So thank you. It's an honor once again uh, to be part of another event with a great organization.
Well, Congressman Zeldman, it's people like you that <clears throat> give us hope and confidence that the future will be bright despite the challenges. Uh, you, you have some decisions to make in the near future and whatever you decision you make, we will be there with you. We're so proud of the work you do. You are a man of not only high intelligence, extreme knowledge, but enormous integrity. It's an honor for us to say that Congressman Lee Zeldin is a friend of the ZOA. Thank you so very much, Congressman. Thank you, Moore. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Congressman. This will conclude our program. We'll just say that, as the Congressman said, we need your support. We're not going to give a, a heavy sell right now, but keeping ZOA strong is the way to achieve the things that the Congressman talked about. And we appreciate those of you who attended this call and your continued support in other ways as well. Thank you all, and this concludes the program.